Hi and welcome. This is the pre-op knee joint replacement surgery class. This talk will take approximately an hour. Uh, you should have received the cheat sheet and copies of the exercise booklet and um, before, during, and after booklet. The overall information will apply to any hospital and most of you are having your surgery in Richmond and there are some specifics that we will go over uh, that the Richmond surgeons wanted us to point out to you. I would like to acknowledge the lands that we are gathered on today, the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. The goal today is to help you identify what equipment you need after your surgery and not everyone will need everything as it does depend on your height. Being set up reduces your anxiety and allows you to practice and just to let you know you are safe to climb stairs after surgery. Uh, so if you do not feel you want to climb stairs after your surgery then make sure you set up and prepare a space for uh, in your home so that you can live on the same floor for a few days. That will help. Being set up reduces your anxiety and it allows you to practice. Uh, please make sure you've got a coach or a partner in care. Uh, they'll obviously be helping you physically and emotionally and will uh, be able to take you to your appointments and they have to have the same goals as you. They must be aware of the surgical plan and expectations. Uh, for example, if your surgeon has discussed uh, going home the same day with you, barring any complications, then please let them know uh, because we do discharge as soon as you are medically stable. What to do at home? Uh, try and stay as healthy as possible. If you uh, drink alcohol, uh, on a daily basis and you smoke on a daily basis and you use recreational substances on a daily basis, try and uh, minimize those. Start um, talking to your family a doctor about um, weaning off uh, simply because uh, there are uh, items that can increase your risk factors in surgery. Uh, declutter your home as much as possible, get rid of any tripping hazards and uh, Pick up and set up your equipment from the Red Cross and just make sure that you've uh, everything is, is set up and you can practice. And then for meals, make sure that you, you know, you've got something organized. If you're freezing meals, get on that. If you're um, having friends and, and uh, family deliver, then you're all set up and then just get your, your chores done. You know, I usually tell people to get their laundry done, get their bedding washed, etc., and have a plan for your pets. Make sure that somebody's there to help you with them. And then look, you'll be using a walker. So figure out how, if you're going to be at home, if you make yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, how are you going to pick that cup up and move it to a countertop so that you can move yourself with the walker because you can't use the walker and, the, and carry a teacup at the same time. We do not recommend a pillow under the knee after you've had your knee replacement. This encourages the knee to remain in a bent position and you will not be able to gain full range. I must emphasize that the first six weeks after your surgery are the most important because at this time, you will be gaining as much range as possible so that you can fully bend and fully straighten your knee so that you can get around and accomplish your activities comfortably. If you wait before you do your exercises, you will not have a good result. So even though you uh, don't want to bend and straighten your knee in the first few weeks, it is crucial that you do your exercises at this time. We will now describe uh, the pieces of equipment so that you will be able to identify what it is you need. For knee patients, generally, if you can get on and off the toilet right now, you do not need a raised toilet seat. 
But if you anticipate having difficulty getting off the toilet uh, because you feel that you won't have enough uh, strength to push yourself off, then a toilet safety frame is an option. The Richmond Hospital does sell two-wheel walkers and crutches. And once you're in the hospital, you can let the physiotherapist know that you would like to purchase if that is your uh, decision, if you do not want to go through the Red Cross. In equipment, we generally recommend a two-wheeled walker, which is this one over here in the middle. We don't recommend the four-wheeled walker because that tends to be unstable. So when you're starting to learn to walk, even though it has brakes, it tends to slide away from people. You lose your balance. And if you fall in the early stages, it's not a good thing. The handle height for the cane, the two-wheeled walker and the crutches is at the wrist joint. So you're standing straight and that wrist joint where your wristwatch would be is generally the height and that's what you would adjust it to. This top part of the crutch over here that goes into your armpit sits two to three fingers below the armpit. This does not go into the armpit. If it pushes into the armpit, it's going to push into nerves and blood vessels and cause damage there. This goes into the side of your chest. The rolled up trouser leg is the operated leg in this video. After surgery, some people first use a two-wheeled walker. This walker allows you to move faster and it slides easier on carpet. As with the standard walker, press down through your arms, step into the walker with your surgical leg and follow with your good leg. The handles of the two-wheeled walker should be at the wrist crease when you're standing straight with your arms at your side. So stairs, we do recommend that you practice going up and down the stairs. You can go up and down the stairs with either a crutch or a cane. Practicing does decrease your anxiety a lot. And uh, just to let you know, um, it's not a reason for us not to send somebody home from the hospital. Sometimes people will say, I've got stairs, I can't go home. The, uh, that is not a reason for us not to send you home. So if you anticipate um, that you're going to have difficulty, then like we said at the start, uh, arrange your home so that you can stay on, the, on, a, on a level that you're comfortable with. And if you feel that you're going to have trouble getting into the house because you have a lot of stairs to get into the house, then an option is to use the non-emergency patient transfer. They will take you from the hospital to your home and put you uh, in the area of your home that you want to be at. You'll obviously have to book them and that there is a fee for the service. And they, I believe they take online booking as well as um, they have a 1-800 number there. In this video, they show you to go up and down the stairs using a crutch. However, you can use a crutch or a cane. You're safe to do either one. A trick to remember how to correctly go up and down stairs is to think of the good or non-surgical leg going up to heaven and the bad or surgical leg going down to hell. So, when going up the stairs, lead with the good non-surgical leg. Grasp the railing and move your good leg up one step, followed by your crutch and then the surgical leg. Continue this way one step at a time. When going downstairs, grasp the railing, place the crutch one stair below, and step down with the bad or surgical leg. Follow with a good or non-surgical leg. Repeat one step at a time. In this video, the 
model is demonstrating as a hip patient, which is why they straighten their leg and use a hip cushion. As a knee patient, you do not require a high density foam cushion and you are safe to bend your knee as you sit down. The best chair to use after hip or knee surgery is one that has a sturdy back and armrests. If a surface is below your kneecap, use a high density foam cushion or bed blocks to raise the height. Make sure the chair is two inches above knee level to maintain hip precautions. Sitting on higher firm surfaces makes it easier to get on and off chairs or beds. To sit, back up to the chair until you feel it against your legs. Extend your surgical leg. Reach back for the armrests and slowly lower yourself onto the chair. Note the hips are higher than the knees. To properly get out of the chair, slide your hips to the seat edge and extend your surgical leg. Push up from the chair using your hands on the armrests and your good leg. In general, I do not recommend a raised toilet seat for a knee replacement patient because the goal of your surgery is for you to gain range. And I encourage patients to use that opportunity when they're sitting on the toilet to get that knee to bend a little bit more. So if you are able to get on and off the toilet right now before your surgery, I generally do not recommend a raised toilet seat. If you are struggling now, then chances are you will need a raised toilet seat. And so uh, we will go over the different types. How to measure the raised toilet seat if you do need one. You bend your knee and mark that bend, and then you take a tape measure and you mark two inches above that line. And then stand next to the toilet and the surface of the toilet to that two inch mark will then determine the average raised toilet seat height that you will require. For people who are six feet tall and above, I generally recommend the commode because there isn't a raised toilet seat that will raise high enough. And if it does, it generally feels unstable. So the commode does uh, raise to the height and then it comes with a shield. And so the waist is directed straight into the toilet, which is uh, much better, so um, safer for you in terms of, of stability. If you're, th you're small like myself and you're sort of five foot one to five foot three and you don't need a raised toilet seat, but you're thinking, but I do need some help to push off the toilet, then a toilet safety frame might be something that you want to consider. And um, just a reminder that when you're using a raised toilet seat, you don't want to be so high off the floor that your feet are dangling because that is also not safe. And it is actually easier to use the toilet with um, your feet on the floor. In this video, the model is demonstrating getting on and off the toilet as a hip patient, which is why the knee is straight. As a knee replacement patient, you are safe to bend your knee, so you can use this opportunity as you sit on the toilet to try and gain extra range. As with a chair or bed, the toilet seat needs to be two inches above the top of your knee. A raised toilet seat can bring the surface to the proper height. It's important to support your arms when getting on and off the toilet. You can attach to the wall a safety frame that fits around the toilet, or some raised toilet seats have built-in armrests. If you're not using armrests, the bathroom countertop should be close enough so that you can push up from it to stand. To sit, back up to the raised toilet seat as you would to a chair or bed. When you feel the toilet behind your legs, extend your surgical leg, bend your good leg slightly, and using both arms, lower yourself onto the seat. To get up, slide forward on the seat, extend your surgical leg, then use your good leg and arm strength to push up. Make sure you press up on both armrests 
so that the device remains steady. Never use a towel rack or toilet paper holder to pull yourself up from the toilet. These could easily come away from the wall and cause you to fall. If you need extra support in the bathroom, consider installing grab bars. In this video, once again, the model is demonstrating as a hip patient and so the knee is straight. As a knee replacement patient, you are safe to bend your knee and we would like you to use this opportunity to bend your knee uh, as you get across on the bench. Use a tub transfer bench to get in and out of the bathtub. Two legs of the bench are in the tub and two are outside. Adjust it so that it is two inches above your knee height. To get in the tub, back up to the bench. Extend your surgical leg and hold onto the back of the bench chair. Slide back on the chair and swing your legs into the tub. Don't reach forward for the taps if you've had hip surgery because this breaks hip precautions. To avoid leaning forward, attach a handheld shower hose to the bench and turn the water on before getting into the tub. To get out of the tub, Bring your legs to the side and swing them over the bathtub. Slide to the end of the bench, hold onto the back of the chair, extend your surgical leg, and then push with your arms and good leg to stand up. Use a non-slip bath mat both inside and outside the tub. If you are struggling putting on your socks as a knee patient, then you can use a sock aid to help yourself. Using an aid to put on socks is required for three months after hip surgery and can be very useful after knee surgery. Slide the sock onto the sock aid. The sock heel should be along the curved bottom with one inch of sock in the gullies. Hold onto the string and place the aid on the floor. Slowly work your foot into the sock until your toes touch the end of the sock. Now, pull on the strings. The aid slips out and the sock moves onto the foot. To remove socks, just slip a long shoehorn into the sock behind the heel. Ice is really important for pain control. So uh, the only thing I ask you is that you put a cloth between you and the ice pack, whether it's the ice machine, a gel pack or a pack of peas. This is to prevent frostbite on the skin. Generally, we ask people to keep the ice on for about 15 to 20 minutes and to use it multiple times throughout the day. Uh, some of you, the surgeons will have asked you to purchase an ice machine, which is, looks something like that. Uh, if you are using that, then the canister, I would suggest that you freeze water bottles or yogurt containers as your ice pack and A, the water will stay cooler and then you're not going to the gas station every two days to get more ice. You don't have to use um, an ice machine. So if it's something that is something that you don't want to do or you can't afford to do, don't worry about it. It's just more convenient. So as long as you are disciplined and have some ice in the house or ice gel packs or frozen peas that you can use on your, knee, your hip, then that will be fine. It helps with the swelling and it helps with the pain. Uh, after surgery, people are surprised that there is swelling and there is, you should anticipate some swelling after surgery. So the ice is helpful. The Richmond Hospital, uh, if you're having your surgery at Richmond Hospital, does sell a, uh, an ice machine called the cryocuff. This one is not motorized, so you have to use gravity to get the water in and out of the pad. And I believe it's about $120 to $150. And when you have your uh, meeting with the nurse at the pre-admission clinic, that is the time that you would purchase it.
So what happens between now and surgery? The pre-admission nurse, as I mentioned, would uh, go over your health history, your medications, and any other instructions for surgery. For example, at this stage, is that this is when they talk to you about the special wipes and washes that you need to do before you come in for surgery. If you need any lab work or x-rays or special tests, this is where they will talk to you about all of that, when to stop your medications and things like that. You have a surgical date, but you don't have a surgical time. And that's because your surgeon is told um, sort of last, not last minute, but uh, fairly close to your surgical day. And then as soon as they know, they will call you. So that generally occurs the day before your surgery is when you'll get a call to say what time your surgery is going to be. So for a Monday surgery, you generally will get a call on Friday afternoon. Uh, then you will follow what the nurse told you about medications, etc., and then just pack very lightly. And generally, we obviously ask you to bring your care card, uh, your CPAP machine if you sleep uh, and you snore and you have a special machine, uh, the ice therapy machine if you have decided that that's what you want to use, glasses and hearing aids so you can uh, see and hear everything around you. Uh, Clothing should be loose, easy, something easy to get on and off. And in the summertime, generally for women, you know, if you can just throw on a loose dress, that's the easiest. And for men, loose shorts are pretty easy. But shoes should have a heel. They should be good shoes to put on. You know, you don't want them slipping off your feet as you're trying to get on your feet. You don't want your shoes to go one way and you to go another way. Uh, bring no valuables, please. Uh, unfortunately, theft does occur in the hospital. So... Um, any valuables, rings, earrings, uh, give them to your, your loved ones there to keep safe. If you are having your surgery in UBC, you need to take your walking aids with you. So that would be your two-wheeled walker or your crutches. If your surgery is in Richmond, uh, St. Paul's or Lionsgate, you do not need to bring the walker into the hospital, but your will need it when you're going home. So whoever is picking you up should have it in the car because you will need it to leave the hospital. Just a reminder that some of the hospitals do sell two-wheeled walkers and crutches. In Richmond, they definitely do. And you could let your physiotherapist know on the ward that that is what you would like to do. Uh, I believe that at Lionsgate, they also sell walkers and crutches. And in St. Paul's, it is crutches. And at UBC, I believe they sell crutches only. Day of surgery, uh, you'd go into admitting, you go into the OR, and then you go into the recovery room. And just to remind you that some of you will be discharged from the recovery room. We do aim for as short a stay as possible. And this could mean discharge within eight hours of your surgery, especially if you and your surgeon have talked about being a same day discharge or a short stay arthroplasty. We will discharge you when you are medically stable and cleared. And uh, whoever is picking you up needs to be advised of this. So please let your family know what you have discussed with the surgeon. Dressings. The surgeons in Richmond wanted us to go over dressings for patients just so that um, you weren't surprised if you woke up and uh, saw something different on your leg. Uh, most of the surgeons use a water resistant dressing, so you can uh, take a quick shower with these on. We do have a couple of surgeons who use a pad and tensor, and if that's your surgeon, then all you have to do is you have to wrap the area with plastic and then just make sure that you tape it so that it's water resistant so that you can have your shower. Okay. One of the dressings that uh, could be used uh, on your incision and it's the Dermabond Prineo dressing and it really looks like it doesn't have anything at all, just a bit of a gauze, but it is uh, sealed uh, and it's got a special glue so it bonds onto the skin. And for that reason, you can't soak and you can't use lotions on it. You can have a quick shower. It is a bit like Gore-Tex. It allows uh, any 
uh, fluid uh, from the incision to come up over the the dressing and then if you have something like that happen you can just use a clean gauze to wipe it uh, and keep it dry like i said it is water resistant it's made to slough off within two to three weeks uh, we don't want you to put lotions on it because that'll degrade the bond and um, it allows us to look uh, and, and monitor at, uh, the wound a little bit easier and uh, just watch out for signs of infection. So swelling, bruising and a little bit of blood or, or fluid is, is normal. Uh, and um, it, again, you just use the clean gauze and you just pat it dry and that's all you need to do. And the nurses will go over this with you uh, when it's time. Ecoderm is just one of the uh, other dressings that we have. And again, it's a clear dressing it places on and it's got special gel like material in the in the uh, dressing so that it absorbs the fluid as it comes away. But it still remains clear. So it allows us to look and monitor at the wound. It's water resistant, so you can shower with it and it stays on for approximately 28 days. And uh, again, you look for signs of infection if you have uh, a fever, pus, excessive redness, swelling, excessive swelling, then just call your surgeon. But other than that, just leave it alone. The tegaderm does change as it stays on you as it ages. It does get a little bit more crinkly, a little bit more wrinkly. But as long as you have no signs of infection, there's no swelling, there's no um, excessive swelling, there's no pus, there's no wound drainage, there's no odor, and it's not leaking, then just leave it alone. The edges roll as well, and if it does roll, don't worry. As long as it's not leaking, that's fine. Just leave it alone, and don't use any extra tape to tape it down, but just leave it alone. Uh, the nurses will go over this with you, so you don't have to to worry. I'm just introducing it to you. Helix is the other water resistant dressing that we use around here, and it can stay on your skin for up to seven days. And again, it's got a gauze pad in there and it does absorb the blood and the fluid. So, you know, don't be surprised. If you're having some drainage and your drainage goes over onto the three edges that is when you would change the dressing. Otherwise, just leave it alone, okay? If you wake up and you see this dressing, nothing bad has happened. This is simply a negative pressure dressing that some surgeons like to use for certain surgeries. And it has a canister which applies the suction. It is water resistant and the nurses will go over it with you. We just wanted to show it to you so that if you see it, you don't panic and uh, think something has happened. Nothing has happened. It is simply a choice of dressing that is available to the surgeon. Uh, medication wise, you know, we want you to have your pain under control. So please take the pain medication as prescribed, even if you feel that you are OK, because for the first two weeks, if we don't get the pain under control, you'll get into trouble. Yeah, and you won't exercise and you won't walk. And we need you to do that to reduce the risk of blood clots and to help with constipation because a lot of people get constipated after surgery. Nausea, if you're feeling nauseous when you are in hospital, just let the nurse know so that we can do something so we can get things under control. And um, most of you, if not all of you, will be put on blood thinners of some sort and then receive some antibiotics while you are in hospital. We do ask that you, if you look at this chart, uh, that you keep your pain in the green zone, so under four. Okay, so we want you to be around two and three. So that's why we say take the pain medication. Don't say, oh, I can handle it, and then move yourself into the orange light, because going from orange to, to red is a, is a very quick step. And so if you miss that opportunity, then you'll get yourself into trouble. We want you to stay in the green zone by using ice and the pain medication so that you will exercise and you will walk. 
If you have swelling and you're experiencing swelling, then elevate your leg. And the easiest way is to lay down on the couch and put your heel on the armrest and put pillows along the leg so that the space is taken up. And then just pump your ankles, move your ankles back and forth, and then just bend and straighten your knee so that you get these big muscles over here to pump and get the swelling up towards your heart. The ice, again, really helps, right? So uh, raising the leg does help with the bruising as well. So in terms of physiotherapy, this is what is going to happen for most of you. The physiotherapist and nurse will come and get you up as soon as the uh, anesthesia wears off. And usually you are weight bearing as tolerated. So we uh, will sit you up, we will get you to stand, we will get you to walk, we will get you to do the stairs. Uh, moving is good. It reduces the uh, risks of blood clot. It's good for your lungs. It's good for your bowels. It's good for your joint, especially for the knee joint. It is really important that you bend your knee and that you straighten your knee. I cannot emphasize enough that the first six weeks after surgery are the most important. This is where you're healing and where you're scarring but it is also the opportunity for us to get as much range back as possible. You need full bending and you need full straightening in order to walk properly, in order to sit down and get out of a chair, to get into a car, to get into an airplane. So it's very important that you do the exercises. Uh, before you have your surgery, you can do uh, the exercises in the booklet, the pages five to eight or at the bottom, it says before surgery. And then after surgery, when you go home, the physio will have shown you exercises. And then you can do the pages that say zero to three weeks or in some booklets, it's pages 10 to 20. But it is really important that as a knee patient, you understand that getting the range of motion early is really important. Uh, we ask that you practice walking with the crutches and you practice doing the stairs now so that you are familiar. So you practice not just with, uh, sorry, not just crutches, with the walker as well. So depending on what you want to use. Uh, general, generally, I recommend the walker. I only recommend crutches for people who are familiar with them and you've used them recently. If you haven't, then just stick with the walker so that you're safest. Follow the booklet with the exercises. And two weeks after surgery is usually when you start going out into the physiotherapy, outpatients either at the hospital or private physiotherapy. And the hospital physiotherapist will organize that with you. OK, they will let you know which hospital you will be going to. And sometimes uh, the local hospital isn't able to take you and then you would have to arrange to go privately. OK. If your surgery is under WorkSafe BC or ICBC, please talk to your case manager. You will need to attend physiotherapy privately. Swimming. A lot of people ask about swimming and hot tubs. You need to wait until you are fully healed. You have no scabs, and that generally is six weeks. Everything has to be closed, okay, and no scabs. We um, obviously make sure that you are medically stable and that you uh, don't have any complications, but we do discharge as early as possible. Early mobility does decrease the risk of complications and it is part of your recovery process. Driving, we generally recommend you wait up to six weeks and be safe uh, walking with no aid, not be on any narcotics. And you need to remember, you need to go from your gas pedal to the brake in an emergency situation. So you will be applying your full force on that. So uh, be confident when, you, uh, when you're going to go driving. Video, the patient uh, again, the model is showing you how to get into a car as a hip patient. As a knee patient, it is not 
that important for you to keep your knee straight. You can bend that knee. It is safe to bend it. We want you to bend it to try and use and get that range as fast as possible. Using a garbage bag to slide across the seat will probably help you. Make sure the passenger seat is pushed back and the seat angle is reclined. If you've had hip surgery, place your high density foam cushion on the seat so that the seat is two inches above your knee height. Back up to the car. Extend your surgical leg. Using your arms for support, lower yourself to the seat. Slide back as far as you can across the seat. Then, bring both your legs into the car. If you've had hip surgery, make sure you maintain hip precautions. To get out of the car, ease your legs out and keep leaning back to maintain hip precautions. Extend your surgical leg and slide to the edge of the seat. Stand up using your good leg and arms for support. Just a reminder, you do not need the hip cushion. That high density foam cushion is for hip patients and not for knee patients. So I just wanted to be clear on that. Uh, just a reminder, you need obviously a ride to go from the hospital home, but don't forget your appointments. You also need help getting to and from your uh, physiotherapy appointments, your medical appointments, and so some of you may need to register with the handy dart and if you do uh, need to use the handy dart let us know and um, if you need the spark handicapped parking pass then you will need to go to the uh, your gp for that for those of you coming from out of town uh, you will know about the travel assistance program so you, uh, make sure that you've got all of that uh, set up and then if you're catching a ferry um, you, they do have the medical assured loading so just make sure that if you need that that you get that um, organized uh, with your physician those two things need to be done through your physician and then for flying, we recommend no flights over two hours for the first six weeks to reduce the risk of blood clots. And so if you do need to fly anywhere, make sure you discuss that with your surgeon. Uh, just a reminder that if you didn't receive the cheat sheet, uh, call us and let us know. And um, to help you find information, the uh, OASIS group is the education group and they, they have uh, uh, lots of information about arthritis on their website. The ASAP group uh, is the Arthritis Surgical Assessment Program which, uh, to which I belong and that re website also has a lot of information. And for the Richmond Orthopedic Sports Medicine group, they have their own website and is a great resource as well. And for those of you that are coming from different surgeons' offices, they all have their own website as well. So please refer to them uh, for any information that you require. Um, my number is uh, up there, the, the group that I belong to in Richmond. So if you end up having any questions, please phone us and we will try and, and answer those questions for you as best as we can. The North Vancouver group also has a number and the Vancouver group also has a number. So if your surgery is in Richmond, then call the Richmond group. If your surgery is in North Vancouver, call the North Vancouver group. And if your surgery is in Vancouver, then call the Vancouver group. The Red Cross is not free. It is by donation. And so uh, if you require equipment from them, just fill out the form for equipment. Uh, with all the details, uh, height, weight, and what you need, and uh, email it to us at that address, and I will fill that out and um, send it out to you, and send it out to the Red Cross. And I will give you the address of the Red Cross in the Lower Mainland. Those are the addresses. Generally, I tell people when once you receive the form from us with the order number, call the Red Cross. Make sure they have the equipment before you pick it up and get it a few days ahead so you can set things up and practice with them and then you're not as anxious. 
And um, please fill out the uh, survey form for us. That really helps us improve and all the best for your upcoming surgery. And thank you.